Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five. I am your host, curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research, Kevin Atkinson. And today I thought that I would help bring you all into a realm where there is no slum of table legs. Um, and that is here in the uh, dining room of the director of Cranbrook Academy of Art, where we see a complete table and chairs from the 1958 pedestal collection designed by uh, famed Cranbrook artist and designer Aero Saarinen. Now, of course, uh, I hope that all of us watching today uh, recognize the name Aero Saarinen, the son of Cranbrook's founding president and architect, Aleel Saarinen, and head of our weaving department, Loya Saarinen. And I'm talking about Arrow again this week. I, those of you who watched two weeks ago, two Wednesdays ago, know that we discussed uh, Arrow in Cranbrook Archives because we are less than one week away from the start of my fifth annual History of American Architecture lecture series. And those lectures will begin on Monday at 11 a.m. We offer two times for the lectures, 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and this year, the History of American Architecture lex lecture series is exploring Aero Saarinen and his circle. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, we're not just going to be talking about uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Aero Saarinen. We'll be talking about all of the people and designers that he worked with. And so every Monday for five weeks, we'll take a single building from the career of Aero Saarinen and Associates, and we'll dissect sort of who are all the players involved in its creation and who were all the people that uh, made the sort of singular 20th century titan of architecture who he was because the great secret of architect architecture is that it is a team sport and it requires many different people. So leading up to uh, the first lecture this coming Monday, January 31st, I thought that we would spend some time talking about a pretty iconic American design classic, the pedestal table. And this chair itself is a collaboration between two Cranbrook greats, uh, Florence Knoll, who studied, uh, she was an orphan born in Saginaw, Michigan. She came to Cranbrook as a high schooler. Uh, she befriended the Sarnins through her art teacher at Cranbrook when a young Florence, who went by Shu, a nickname from her last name, Schust, uh, young Shu said, I want to be an architect, and her art teacher, who was Cornell University's first woman architecture student, she told young Shu, if you want to be an architect, there's only one couple you need to meet, marched her across here to the Sarnins, and Shu presented her young uh, uh, architectural sketches. Now, Shu would go on to study architecture at Cranbrook and at the IIT in Illinois. She was working as an architect in New York when she married Hans Knoll, and she married into that German-American family's furniture company. Now, Shu Florence Schust Knoll Bassett would revolutionize Knoll furniture, and when she was in the process of sort of inventing the mid-century modern aesthetic, along with other designers like Charles and Ray Eames, she was turning to people like the Eameses, like Aero Sarnen and Harry Bertoia for designs. And Aero Sarnen's first design, which I talked about at live, live at Five, his first design for Florence Knoll, Florence and Hans Knoll, was the Model 70, and that's the womb chair. And those chairs, the womb chair launched in 1948, the last section of the womb chair, the Model 72, which is the executive armchair, was launched in 1951. And it was three years between the launch of that line of Aero Saarinen's furniture for Knoll before we come to the Pedestal Collection. And so the Pedestal Collection, which is the focus of today's talk, comes about uh, after conversations between Aero Saarinen and Hans Knoll in November of 1954. Now, Hans Knoll's uh, father had been a furniture maker uh, in Germany. He worked in uh, Dessau, which is, of course, famously home of the Bauhaus. And so Hans Knoll's family had already been involved in the creation of modern furniture. 
When Hans immigrates, he comes to America and he's making very traditional furniture. But once Hans marries Florence Shu, uh, they, they really transform the company into sort of one of the great leading furniture companies in America, particularly for modern design. So in November of 1954, Eero Saarinen is talking to Hans Noll, and he's discussing the fact that there are four-legged chairs, there are three-legged chairs, there are two-legged chairs, and he sees it as his great design challenge to invent a one-legged chair. And when Eero Saarinen was talking about this with his office later, uh, he told them uh, that uh, basically, uh, a sort of festival of chairs, having four ch legs beneath each chair, uh, turn them into sort of blocks. And so if you have one chair with four legs, you have a sort of block in the space beneath it. And Eero Saarinen, um, he said that he didn't want this sort of visually disruptive, very ugly sort of, uh, he, he called it a slum of chair legs. And instead he wanted to think about the a furniture line that would have just one leg that instead of being about the shape of the leg or the shape of the chair seat, it would be about the sculptural space between chair legs. And I think you can see that on your screen now, the way that, yes, the chairs all have a single pedestal, but they also are creating a very fluid, a very structural form in the spaces that are between the individual chairs. In a telegram uh, sent off to Hans Noll, uh, Eero Saarinen describes his project, or in a letter to Hans Noll, he describes the project and he ends the letter by saying, we will wipe Herman Miller off the map. And if you know much about American furniture history, you know that Noll and Herman Miller are the two great titans of uh, American furniture. Of course, this letter is now a little bit more awkward because Hull and Her Noll and Herman Miller became Miller Noll last year when the two great companies merged. Now, once Eero Saarinen begins thinking about the chair, and I have brought one up here, set it on the kitchen counter here in Millis House for us to get a better view. Uh, once Eero Saarinen goes about setting out to design the chair, he knows that it's going to be plastic. And he's thinking about his Cranbrook uh, colleague, his Cranbrook friend, Charles Eames, who starting in the 1940s in Los Angeles had been developing plastic share, shell chairs. And so if you've been over to the Henry Ford Museum, you know that they have the original Kazam machine that was uh, used by Charles and Ray Eames in their LA house. In order to use heat and pressure uh, in a vacuum pump that was operated by a bicycle pump to squeeze resin and fiberglass together into a shell chair. What Eero Saarinen admired about this is the sort of technological whimsy, the impressive nature of using plastic to create a shell. Uh, this is a, an Eames plastic shell that I use in my apartment. But what Eero and Florence did not like as they were thinking about collaborating on their own uh, plastic shell chair is the fact that you can see the fibers of the fiberglass. And so those little lines that you see, those are not scratches. Those are places where the plastic resin uh, is the, the fiber of fiberglass is actually sitting in front of the plastic shell. And so it is scratchy. I mean, this chair has a, a pretty intense texture on it. It also is visually not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And so we're going to talk about how Eero Saarinen resolves his fiberglass because you can tell just texturally, aesthetically, they're very different. The other thing that Eero Saarinen did not like about the Herman Miller made Eames plastic shell chair were the legs. And Eero Saarinen basically said, chair designers in the 20th century have been so excited by plastic and plywood that they have forgotten about the chair leg. And so he says, uh, as he's thinking about setting out designing the pedestal chair, Eero Saarinen describes it as a problem of chair design is a structural total. Uh, and so he says that it needs to be all of one thing in the same way that the ancient Egyptian chairs were all of one thing, all the way up to Thomas Chippendale, and that Chippendale wooden furniture was all of one thing. It was all wood and joinery. And so he says, instead of making a revolutionary new plastic shell, I want to make a revolutionary new one material plastic chair where the legs and the seat are all integrated together. 
Now, Hans Knoll has known Aero Saarinen at this point for five years, close to ten years. Florence Knoll has known him for 20 years, and they both know that Aero Saarinen has a very specific way of working, and that specific way of working is slow. He is a famously slow designer, famously methodical. He would sort of get stuck in his head, get stuck in his sketchbooks, he would explore every option possible. And so Hans Knoll sends our first uh, collaborator of today's Live at Five out to Aero Saarinen and Associates here in Bloomfield Hills. And he doesn't just send any uh, sort of product designer from Knoll, uh, but he sends Don Pettit. And Don Pettit had studied at the Institute of Design in Chicago. Uh, he was good friends uh, with people at Eros Arnon and Associates. And as soon as he arrives in 1955, uh, he really hits it off with Aero Sarnin. And Don Pettit will stay here in Bloomfield Hills for two years, just working on the pedestal chair. Now, the project that Don had just come off of was working with another Cranbrook great, Harry Bertoya, in the manufacturing of the Bertoya wire chairs. And one lesson that Don learned working with Harry Bertoya is that basically Harry Bertoya designs these chairs for Noel, uh, and then he leaves it up to Noel to figure out how to put it together. And that ends up creating some strife in the production of the chairs because you have the division of de uh, sort of vision of the designer, Harry Bertoya, who wants to have these wireframe chairs intersecting with the reality of production at Knoll in Pennsylvania and the compromises that sort of came about later, sort of Harry Bertoya's design the chair, and then Don Pettit comes back from Knoll saying, oh, well, we have to do this, we have to do this. And so when Pettit comes to Bloomfield Hills to work on the pedestal chairs, he's thinking about this relationship with Bertoya, and he really becomes a collaborator with Aero Saarinen. And he says, you know, you're the designer of this chair, I am here to make the reality come true. And the way that they would work is that Don would create all of these different models of the chairs, and then Aero would come by and critique the models and make suggestions. Now, one thing that you may notice about these models that are here in this book, uh, Furniture for Every Man by Brian Lutz, the leading scholar of Aero Sarnin's furniture, is that there are a lot more shapes. There are a lot more double curves and hearts. There's also these cutouts in the back of the chair. And Aero Sarnin really liked these cutouts. He had used similar cutouts in earlier chairs like the Model 72. Um, which I should have tagged, so you can see here the Model 72. This is a plastic shell on a plywood seat with metal legs. And what Arrow was trying to do with the pedestal collection was to eliminate these three materials, really five materials, upholstery, foam, plywood, plastic, and legs, and give us a unibody shell chair where you have plastic shell, plastic pedestal. Now, they worked for about a year on this project when they head out to, um, New Jersey to the Winter Manufacturing. And Winter Manufacturing in New Jersey had uh, worked with Aero Sarnin and Knoll in the production of the womb chair. They were a fiberglass boat company, but not too many people were working in fiberglass. And so they were very limited as to who could actually make the idea of a plastic chair. And thinking of Aero Saarinen's career as being a series of collaborations, when they get to Winter Manufacturing, Winter tells them, you know, if you put a chair in the back of that, visually, I get it, you know, functionally, um, I, I understand why you want that hole there, but every time that you sit in that chair, you are going to be putting the most stress on these two joints. And if there is a hole here, the most dangerous part of a chair is where the seat intersects with the back. And so you really do not need a hole here because the single shell plastic is going to be much stronger without it. And also the thing with injected molded plastic, it's injected from the bottom and the resin sort of is squeezed out into the steel form. That hole is going to create really big issues trying to get the plastic to sort of the resin to fill in the back of the seat. And so working on the suggestions of the manufacturer, uh, Aero Saarinen and Don Pettit say, okay, there's no hole in the back of the chair. It will be a single unified shape. Now, Don Pettit writes quite a bit about working with Aero Saarinen, and he's shocked when he gets to Bloomfield Hills at not only how slow Aero Saarinen is, but also how methodical he was. 
and how Eros Arnon would go through hundreds of sketches, dozens of models, and he would attempt to try every single possible solution before arriving at the final one. And one thing that Don Pettit writes to back to Hans Knoll is he says, we live in an age of great sort of functionalism, where so many of our designers and so many of our products are developed by function. And I think when I was reading that letter earlier today, preparing for this, I think of uh, some of Florence Knoll's furniture and sort of how Florence Knoll designs her own tables and couches. And it really is all about the function. You're seating one person, you're seating two people. It's graphic, it's square, it's modern, it's beautiful, it's very efficient. Function really reigns supreme. But what Don Pettit says Aero Sarnin is doing is not really even thinking about function. He's hardly thinking about structure. Instead, he arrives at form chosen because of some almost mystical rightness. And that it's right only for Aero Sarnin on the most personal of reasons that seem to have nothing to do with function. And that Aero Sarnin is designing this chair as a sculptor not as a sort of the logical, almost engineering aspects of architecture. And I think that if you sign up for my History of American Architecture lecture series, you're going to see that this is a sort of repeated theme of Eros Arnon's architecture. He, like his father, has this sort of confidence in a rightness of design, that there is some sort of truth or artistic principle that is above and beyond sort of functional requirements. And so you end up with furniture that is quite beautiful, but also quite sculptural. And it was Florence Knoll who, for most of her life, when she would discuss working with Eros Arnon for the, their 10 or uh, 15 years of collaboration, she would always say, well, first and foremost, Eros Arnon was not an architect designing furniture, he was a sculptor designing furniture and a sculptor designing buildings. And so I think that ultimately this very sculptural quality of the chair comes about because of the sort of iterative process of making many models, many sketches, and arriving on what was the most satisfying form that also just stood up. You know, it, it does pass the test of function, but that's not really leading us to uh, the end product. Now, as they're working with winter manufacturing in New Jersey, they begin to have to fight the texture of fiberglass. And earlier chairs by Eros Arnon for Knoll solved the problem of the sort of hideousness of fiberglass by simply upholstering the chair. But with the pedestal chair, Eros Arnon, he said he wants to get back to this idea of a structural total. He doesn't want to cover the upholster the whole chair. And so he begins to work on new fiberglass technology. And he has introduced uh, to a, a, a technology that uses a fiberglass veil, is what it's called. And after you make the main fiberglass form, you put a very thin level layer of microscopic fiberglass threads. So instead of the very big glass threads that Eames is using out in LA, uh, in New Jersey, they're using these tiny, tiny threads that are more like human hair size. And they are so small that the resin actually wicks to the front of the chair. So these two chairs are made with the exact same material, that's glass, fiberglass, and resin. But here it's been given a fiberglass veil. And so on the end, you only can see what feels like plastic. So it is structural plastic. It's quite sort of impervious. These chairs are pretty hard to break, though I've seen it happen not in person, uh, but, but it's extraordinarily strong. It has all the strength of fiberglass, but because of the fiberglass veil put across the top of it, you end up with a completely smooth surface. Now, the issue was the edge of the chair would not be perfectly smooth. Now, these chairs have been here for about 10 years. They're beginning to show some of the wear of using them in an institutional setting. And you can maybe see, if Facebook is really nice, that the edge is actually exposing the fiberglass threads. And this was the second problem that Aero Sarandon had in making fiberglass chairs, was that when it comes out of the mold, this edge is incredibly rough. And so what Herman Miller does for Eames is just sands down the edge and you round it over. What Aero decides to do is to actually bring the edge almost to a complete semicircle. And so he is hiding the actual joint of the mold in here. And so this is a cast 
edge with the, the lip of the mold is actually inset, instead of having the lip of the mold be at the exact halfway mark. Then it is sanded, uh, and this actually adds quite a bit of strength to the chair as well. It turns it into almost like a structural I-beam, where you have the, the main strength of the chair is the back, and then it is folded. Think about how strong a paper airplane is if you fold a sheet of paper. Uh, and so by folding the edge, it's adding an enormous amount of strength to the individual chair. And then it's also providing a handle so that when I approach the dining room here in Millis House, you can actually sort of uh, pick up these chairs and move them about the room using this essentially manufacturing detail, sort of how the chair is molded together. Now, the great problem that we had started with at the beginning was, uh, is there a way to have a structural total where everything is all of one thing, as Eero Saarinen said? Well, one of the great um, uh, sort of arts and crafts ethos is truth to materials and sort of the beauty of material. Uh, but the problem with that saying in the case of the pedestal chairs was that, sure, it was truth to materials, but the materials were ugly. And so they solved those first with the fiberglass shell, and then truth to materials, that's great, but plastic can't actually do this. And so uh, this becomes a cast aluminum base instead of a plastic shell. And so instead of being one piece, which you read it as one piece because you have powder coated aluminum and then uh, fiberglass veiled plastic, there is the joint where you have the fiberglass shell and the aluminum meeting together. Now, this brings us to another uh, problem with the chair, which was that Florence Knoll uh, noticed Whenever, when anyone was, would get up from the swivel versions of these chairs, ours don't swivel, but if you stood up from the swivel version, every chair would be going a different direction. And so Bob Savage at uh, Arrow's office, he invented a brass return so that in versions that swivel, you, if you've ever sat in them, you know that you can spin around to about 180 degrees, and when you get up, the chair always goes back to the right direction. And so this was one of the first products to use this memory return spring swivel. And that was so that, you know, we're, we're defeating the slum of legs. Uh, you don't then want to cause a sort of carousel of tulip chairs. Uh, and so by having the memory return swivel, everything always snaps back into place. So we talked about the manufacturer of the chair. Aerosarden never really wrote much about the fact that it is in fact aluminum and plastic and not all plastic. He said there will one day be an all plastic chair. He was quite confident that it would come out even if he hadn't done it. Uh, but he did get wind that George Nelson over at Herman Miller was designing a similar one-legged collection. And so Florence Knoll hears this, and if you know anything about business, you have to be the first to market. And so all of these models had been made here in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, they were being photographed at Aerosarnan's own home on Vaughn Road when they were rushed to New York and about nine months ahead of any fathomable moment that these chairs would be ready for marketing they launch the chair. And so they launch it just with prototypes. It's unclear to me whether they said these are all prototypes. They simply said coming February 1959, but it's May 58, here's our collection. And George Nelson that night, who he had obviously, you know, seen some sort of spy footage of the Knoll showroom launch, he sends Aerosarnan a telegram and it simply says, you win. And Herman Miller cuts the production on their pedestal collection, knowing that a, Eros Arnens was better than George Nelson's, and B, it would only look like a knockoff once Noel had announced to the world that Eros Arnens pedestal chairs were coming out. It would be a Noel phenomenon and not a Herman Miller phenomenon. Once they are launched, they become sort of instant cultural icons, um, uh, though they are not commercially the most successful, in part because it is a very distinct aesthetic. You know, these chairs are used on Star Trek. They're uh, used in sort of any time that you want to say someone is chic. They're modern, they're urban, they're, they, they have great design sets. You know, these are the chairs you use. But they're not exactly cozy sort of domestic chairs, and they're also pretty single use. You really only want to sit and eat in these. They, are, they don't, though he envisioned them as an 
they're not quite comfortable enough to use a sort of an office chair or a reception chair. So they become limited in their success, though they also become sort of cultural phenom phenomenons and one of the most iconic products that Knoll ever makes. Of course, in addition to the chairs, there are also the pedestal tables. And here we're looking under ours at Millis House. And one big difference between the plastic and aluminum chair is that the table is actually made of cast iron. And then the tabletop comes in plastic laminate. It comes in marble, rosewood, walnut, teak. Today, it really comes in any variety of materials. Also quite different, the design of the table versus the design of the chair was that Aerosarnan designs the table entirely at the drafting board. So he is not involved in the actual fabrication of models. So think about Don Pettit. He was busy in the Aerosarnan and Associates model shop here in Bloomfield Hills, making dozens and dozens of models of chairs. However, the table, Aerosarnan drafts the shape. He bases it off of the, the sort of final shape of the chair leg, and he sends it to Knoll in Pennsylvania. And they actually turn it on a lathe, and they make the original tables are all out of wood turning. Once Aerosarnan visits the factory, he says, yes, that's the right shape, and they begin to cast them in iron. Why iron and not aluminum? Well, the chairs are aluminum so that they are light enough to move around to be able to lift and shift them. The tables are cast iron so that they are heavy enough that they do not fall over, and that this pretty slender table leg can support what is a, I don't know, 10-foot slab of marble. And then Aerosarnan files about a dozen patents. He patents his memory swivel, he patents uh, the chair form, he patents the fiberglass veil, he patents the chair shape, he patents the table ta shape, and then he also even goes down as to patent uh, the edge of the table here. And this is, of course, nothing new. Every furniture company from the 19th century to today patents elements like this, uh, but it is interesting to me that the edge of the table lip is a patented knoll design. And of course, the tables are launched not only as a dining table, like we see here, but you also have the coffee table, which looks great with any other Knoll product. And then there are also the little side cocktail tables. Um, I actually don't know if the cocktail table is cast aluminum or cast iron. Let's see, how heavy do we think you are? Oh, it is distinctly heavier than the chairs. I would say that even the little table is cast iron and not cast aluminum. So I have just a couple of other things I tagged in this beautiful book. If you want the book, it is very expensive. If you want to give me the book, what a wonderful gift. Um, uh, but this is the photo of the prototype by Don Pettit and Aero Sarnin in the backyard of Aero Sarnin and Associates in Bloomfield Hills. And here, because it hasn't been powder coated or painted, you can see the, uh, that it is a cast aluminum base within the uh, uh, pressure molded fiberglass shell. And so this is the sort of rough outline of the early product before they had figured out how to create the fiberglass veil um, uh, with the cast plastic. Now, the other great thing about this chair is it does become somewhat of an icon of uh, mid-century modern advertising, whether it is uh, uh, Knoll's own advertisements, where Herbert Matter does this wonderful two-page spread in the architectural magazines, where the first page shows this sort of mysterious form on a single leg wrapped in paper, and the next page you flip it over and it unwraps to this very glamorous mid-century modern woman sitting on her uh, Knoll pedestal chair. Or one of my favorite advertisements. This is not an advertisement for Knoll, it's an advertisement for Tupperware. And so you see here our happy homemaker who is sitting on her plastic shell chair uh, with all of her beautiful plastic Tupperware. And so if you know much about Knoll and mid-century modern design, you know that the pedestal chair, after its successful launch in February of 1959, really becomes one of the leading icons of the company. So thank you very much for another uh, Live at Five. Uh, I'll end with this photograph of the Miller House. This Miller House is going to be um, uh, featured in the upcoming History of American Architecture lecture series. 
every single uh, week from January 30th to February 28th, we will be featuring another uh, project, another building from Aero Saarinen and Associates. And each week we will be going through and talking not just about the building, not exactly a history of five buildings, but a history of how Aero Saarinen manages to uh, be working as a Finnish American immigrant here in Bloomfield Hills, center of Cranbrook and not much else, but how he is able to attract so many important designers, whether it's Florence Knoll, his collaborator on this set, uh, Hans Knoll, her husband, or whether it's people like Don Pettit, who helped him to make his idea of a single chair furniture line, a single stick, single leg furniture design a reality. Uh, every week we will be uh, going through from the Kleinhounds Music Hall in Buffalo to the Miller House I just showed you, the General Motors Technical Center, the TWA Terminal at JFK, and the CBS Tower in New York. We will be thinking about all of the people that were involved in the making of Aero Sarnen projects and how working alongside these people, uh, sort of 20th century design was radically transformed and the place that Aero Sarnen and Associates fit within the great history of architecture. I'm excited to finish up the first week's lecture. I'm excited to deliver it to you on Monday at 11 a.m. and again at 7 p.m. If you can't come during the live broadcast, uh, we will be able to offer a recording after that. So head over to center.cranbrook.edu and sign up for those lectures today. Uh, until next time, I'm Kevin Atkinson with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And I hope that all of you are having a wonderful night. And I hope maybe some of you are out enjoying the Live at Five from a pedestal chair. Goodbye, everyone.